This is Kyle Swicegood with the Rotary Club of Moxville, and I'm here with Don Wooten, and we're continuing our conversation with World War II veterans. And I am very happy uh, to have another veteran that I've known most all of my life, and that is John Barber. John, how are you? Fine. Good. Let's Good to be here. And I'm glad you're here. Yeah. Uh, you, uh, you and I have known each other a long time. You've got a lot of history in Davie County. You. Right. Right. In fact, you're one of the first county managers, if not first, first county manager in 1970. 1970. That's right. Now, just so you'll know, John, I was three years old when you were a county manager. Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> well, your your dad was with me too on that first board. He was. He That's was. Right. Sound good, John? We're going to go straight to uh, just before the war started. 1940. Let's go to that year. What was happening in your life? In my life? Mm -hmm. Well, in 1940, I was uh, just finishing up carrying papers for the Journal of Sentinel. Mm -hmm. And that, and you know, the, that was six papers, I mean, days, morning and evening in the Sunday paper, and uh, 35 cents a week. That's what we paid for that paper. Thirty-five cent a week. A week. Mm -hmm. That's correct. Wow. But that's what I was doing. Okay. So what happened? Did you go to the mailbox one day and find a letter from Uncle Sam saying we'd like to have you? <laughs> well, I was too young now, Kyle, at that time. Mm -hmm. In 1941, uh, my brother and I were 16 years old. You had a twin brother. That's right. What was his name? Worth Henley Barber. Worth Henley Barber. Right. Okay, so twin brother, 16 years old. Right. All right. And uh, I'll never forget when we heard the news about the Japanese attacking Pearl Harbor. Mm -hmm. And I said, Dad, you on, Worth. You realize that Dad missed World War II. I mean, I'm sorry, World War I, and we're going to miss World War II because the Marines are going over there and clean up everything in about a month's time. Mm -hmm. Little did I know. But I, I'll never forget making that statement. So uh, it was a much bigger event than you anticipated. That's correct. And I think it was for a lot of Americans. So I guess in 1943, you were 18. That's correct. Uh, is that the point that you got your invitation to come? Well, let me, I was a senior at Reynolds High School mm -hmm. in 1943. Of course, this is back a week had the graduation in June that year. Mm -hmm. But uh, and that senior year, this commander from the Navy came to Reynolds High School. And he wanted to talk to me, any of the boys that were interested flying for the Navy. Well, my mother, uh, I'm sorry, my brother and I jumped at that opportunity mm -hmm. to fly with the Navy. But uh, and, and this commander worked with us for three days and three nights trying to get us to pass the high test. Mm -hmm. We had passed all the other requ requirements, the mental test, so forth, and uh, but we couldn't pass that Navy requirements. That, you know, when you landed on aircraft carriers, you got to be good. And I'm sure the good Lord was looking after us, but. Uh, to make a long story short, we couldn't pass because we had stigmatism in our uh, left eye. We didn't know it because we thought we had 20-20 vision. Mm -hmm. And uh, so that knocked us out of that Navy uh, that we were interested in. So Worth and I decided to go ahead and volunteer for the draft. If anything happened, you know, that we would not be accepted of course, we were not looking for that, but that we, you know, could go off to NC State, number one college in North Carolina. And uh, I guess you, uh, you're definitely you bleed red. Some people bleed Carolina blue, but you bleed red. That's good. <laughs> right. But uh, and so we volunteered for the draft. I never will forget it. Seventy-nine boys left Winston-Salem. Now we had to go to. Camp Cross down in Spartanburg, South Carolina first for our physical. And I never will forget that because I knew I had a 
a left leg. I had an infection when I was a baby, and uh, about, uh, I guess, eight months old. They had to put me in the hospital down there in Charlotte. Didn't have any of these modern medicines and all, but anyhow, the doctor took care of me, but this left leg was a little bit shorter, a little bit weaker than the other. And, and I just said a prayer, please don't let me get caught down there in this, when they were checking us down at Camp Cross. There were 10 of us in a line, and there were two do medical doctors at a desk there in front of us. I happened to be on the end of the, this line of, uh, we didn't have a stitch of clothes on. Yeah, I've heard that but, today. But the, the one thing, when I had to fall down on my knees and get up without using my hand, I had to use my hands, but luckily those doctors didn't see it. Mm -hmm. So I was the happiest boy in the world going back to Winston-Salem on the bus that I'd been past everything down there to Camp Cross. So you and Worth both went down there together? That's right. Mm -hmm. We were down there together. He was right beside me. Mm -hmm. And uh, so <laughs> about three weeks after that, 79 boys from Winston-Salem went to Fort Jackson. And, of course, we, we took the tests and the physicals and everything that they required. They picked 10 boys to go into the Army Air Corps cadet program. And so we were really excited about that, you know, the 10 out of 79. So both you and Worth both were in the Accepted, team. yeah. Both of you were. All right. So we called home and went to come. A couple of days after that's when they said we were shipping out. And uh, Mother and Dad said, well, where are you going? We said, oh, Texas or California? Ended up in Greensboro, North Carolina. <laughs> TC number 10. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and uh, for basic training. Mm -hmm. And my dad, who was a railroad conductor, he was training a fast, he was running between Winston-Salem in Greensboro, he made two trips during the day, mm -hmm. all in pasture back in that time. But anyhow, we were quarantined for three weeks, but uh, that's where we took basic training. Uh, when we ended our basic training, they loaded us up on Pullman cars. And when we left Greensboro, I said, Worth, you know where are we going? He said, I'm thinking just like you. We're going to leave out of here. We're going to go through Advan. We're going to Knoxville. We're going to hit Barber Junction. John and, Barber. Yeah, Barber Junction. Named after my grandfather. He had a hotel down there. And, uh, <laughs> but, uh, and when we got, to, this is an interesting story. When our train got to Barber Junction, and of course, we were both very familiar about the rails and how the trains left Barber. And my Aunt Ethel and Uncle Shell's home was close to the <coughs> tracks. And Worth and I hollered off to Aunt Ethel and let all the kin folks know we we're here. <laughs> and so all of these people came and she said, anything you've got on the stove, said, bring it down. Those boys will want it. <laughs> and uh, they stopped the, they so, stopped the train? Uh, they stopped well, the what we did, they pulled in the Y to head. You had to go over here on the main line to Asheville. And I knew we were going to go to Asheville with the way they, the train went by on this, the, what we call the Y. And then it backed down into the station. Mm -hmm. Well, when it backed down the station, all of these people were out there and had sausage biscuits and had pie and cookies and everything. Well, the train commander went wild. He said, how did all these people know you were coming through here? We said, sir, we didn't know that till we got here. <laughs> That's what we told him. And I said, my aunt and uncle live right close to the railroad, and they called all our kin folks. He took us back in his compartment. He said, I want you to tell me how y'all violated security. I said, sir, we hadn't violated anything. I'll, I'll put my hand on the Bible. We hadn't violated. And so he finally gave up. And so, <laughs> but anyhow, it was a 
funny I, because later I was one of those uh, gr uh, train commanders mm -hmm. when I came back from Korea. Oh, really? And I took a troop train down to Camp Polk, Louisiana. I never will forget that. Mm -hmm. But anyhow, when we left Barbara Junction, we knew they were going to be letting these Pullmans off at various colleges. The first college they hit, or city, was University of Tennessee. Mm -hmm. They took off, I think, four cars there because they, that was a big school. And so then they took off more when they got to Dayton. When they got over to Columbus, Ohio, and Worth and I were being assigned to Capital University. It's a Lutheran school. 600 girls, 250 cadets. My goodness. That's, yeah. that's a good, uh, if you're a man, that's a, that's a good college to go to. That's right. So, Poor uh, girls. <laughs> <laughs> but anyhow, when they let our Pullmans off there, I never will forget it. Captain Chillins, who was the company, I mean the commander of that college uh, of cadets, uh, he uh, introduced himself and he said, let me tell you boys, you're gonna be dressed to the inch degree. You're gonna be wearing, you know, officer's uniform. And uh, he said, I want you to get your coats tailored. I want your shirts tailored. And he said, you know, your dad wears these socks with garters. Well, some of those boys didn't know what a garter was, I did. <laughs> but anyhow, he said, I want, and they didn't have elastic in socks during World War II. So he said, I want every one of you boys to have garters. Keep those socks up. Got to look sharp. And then he said, because we were lined up in three columns, he said, every boy that doesn't know how to dance, step up to the front here. I <laughs> thought, well, what kind of outfit are we in? <laughs> but I tell you, it was wonderful. We were there six months, and it was wonderful the way, you know, everything worked out. And, uh, of course, getting six months of it, uh, education, a lot of it pertaining to flying. They even had 10 hours of flying instruction when mm -hmm. I was there. Mm -hmm. And uh, I'll tell you one other funny thing. My dad had a friend who was at uh, Lockburn, Arm Lockburn Army Air Base, which was at Columbus, Ohio, right there in the mm -hmm. same city, who was a major. And it, it, they had called him, and mother and dad had come up to visit us. And uh, the, the major invited all of us, Worth and I, mother and dad, to the officer's club for dinner on Sunday. Mm -hmm. And while we was there eating, he asked Worth and I, he said, uh, have you boys ever been up? Well, he said, no, nope, <coughs> never been off the ground. He said, would you like to go up on the B-17? Yes, sir. So after we had eaten lunch, he took us out there on the line, and uh, the B-17s were taking off and landing, you know, doing their practices. And so he commandeered one of those B-17s, put Worth and I on there. And I guess we were on that uh, B-17 about uh, an hour. And so that was the first plane we ever went up. I bet that yeah. was an exciting day. Oh, it was an yeah. exciting time. Now, did you guys, uh, did you go to either the Pacific or the Atlantic Theater? No, we went to Italy. Oh, you went European to Italy? European Theater. Okay. Right. Mm -hmm. And I'm gonna, I'm, I know you need for me to move on. Yeah. But anyhow, okay. at the end of our six-month educational time there at uh, Capital University. Uh, the c commanding officer called me in. I was one of the student officers there. And he said, John, I've got bad news. He said, I didn't realize you and your brother didn't join the Army Air Corps cadets from, volunteered from civilian life. I said, no, sir. We were selected at Fort Jackson, 10 of us. And he said, well, we got a problem. They put out a directive that every cadet, because mm -hmm. see, this was in the spring of 1944, 
by February. And uh, he said they've decided they've got plenty of pilots, bombardiers, and navigators. So any boy that didn't volunteer from civilian life is going to have to go back to the old unit. Well, I told him, I said, we've never been assigned to anything else. He said, well, you're going to gunner school. And he said, I'm going to put you in charge of 13 of you going to Kingman, Arizona. So that's where we ended up in gunnery school. And I'm on, we were training on B-17 by the way there too. But one day, when at about the end of our session there, uh, I was flying high out at high altitude and my electric heated suit went out. And when I left the, the ground there, the temperature was about 103, and these were the old-fashioned electric suits. It looked like underwear. And, of course, I was sweating when I got in that airplane. Then when it went out up there where it was about 30 below zero, I came down with a strep throat. I've never had a strep throat before and never had one since. Mm -hmm. They put me in the hospital, and while I was in the they hospital, they had to They were chipping the ice off of me, yeah. weren't they? <laughs> while I was in the hospital, they gave the final exam. And my twin brother, and he's good, I mean, at taking tests, but he made 80, and he was real pleased with it. So when they let me out of the hospital after three days, I said, Worth, bring me up to date on that test I've got to take. You're not taking it. I said, what do you mean? When they call you to go to take it, I'm going. We were identical <laughs> twins. You know. And I said, <laughs> I guess there's a, a convenience there. I said, there. Uh, well, well that, I'm glad. I mean, boy, if, you, if you're ready to take that, he made 100 on that test. I mean. So you're the smart one. <laughs> <laughs> That's a true story. That is funny. So we left Kingman and went to Lincoln, Nebraska, and that's where they formed the, the crews together. Mm -hmm. Of, you know, the officers and the enlisted men. And they called out my brother and and also me for B-24s. I almost, I said, B-24s? Because I'd kind of fallen in love with that B-17. It's kind of the glamour boy of World War II, you know. Mm -hmm. But anyhow, and, and I really, I got a good crew because my pilot's last name was Huxemeyer. He was a good German. Mm -hmm. And he was one excellent pilot. And uh, But anyhow, we left there. Worth had his crew, and of course my crew left at the same time. And uh, we went out to Mountain Home, Idaho. And uh, Mountain Home, Idaho was really a beautiful area but when we were doing a lot of flying that was we were taking our combat training and uh but uh and i never will forget one of the worst times of my life is this pilot said hey if you look out across look at, at out around nine o'clock did you see that fire out there one of the B-24s crashed. I said, what was the number? And they said, 66. And I knew my brother was on that plane. And I said, Huck was my pilot's first name. I said, Huck, uh, oh, can the tower give us any other information? And he said, I'll check right now. And he called. He said, they know seven shoots came out. Well, I felt a little better then. My brother was a nose gunner on that uh, plane because I felt like all of the gunners at least bailed out. Maybe the pilot and co-pilot and engineer was, you know, staying with the plane a little bit longer. But anyhow, when we landed, my pilot said, John, come with me. We're going to go over to, to, uh, to the tower and talk to them again. And so we went over there and uh, they had an ambulance that had, I mean, several that had gone out. And uh, they had picked up uh, nine of the boys. We had a 10-man crew. And uh, the tail gunner was still missing. And, of course, the boys were all 
kind of joking and uh, that by that time and said, oh, he went into town to get a beer. So, <laughs> so but anyhow, the very next day, of course, uh, the Army Air Corps located the body of the tail gunner. He just failed to, to, to jump until it was too late. And uh, in fact, Worth went out to camera hatch and Worth said to Dieterman, who was the boy from uh, uh, Missouri, said, Dieter? And Dieter said, well, you go first. I'll be right behind you. And of course, that's the last time Worth saw him. Mm. But anyhow, we graduated, our crews did there at uh, Camp, uh, Mountain Home, Idaho. And uh, we uh, w went to pick up our B-24s at uh, brand new ones. Boy, I'll tell you, they were slick. Uh, Kansas City, Missouri. I never will forget. And of course, uh, our time there, uh, we spent about three weeks. Uh, of course, there was a lot more work on, I'm sure, the pilot, co pilot, no, uh, navigator, and bombardier. Mm -hmm. But we had all become like brothers by this time. And uh, where I learned to love the B 24, back in the waist, it's about six or seven feet wide back where the two gunners are mm -hmm. and with you know on a b-17 it's just like a almost well it is a catwalk back there and uh so we fell in love with that b-24 we could carry more bombs father we had to fly at a little bit lower al altitude we flew at 32,000. Mm, and that's still high. That is. <clears throat> now, were there four engines on that plane? Four, uh, four <clears throat> engines, yeah. Uh, what was the horsepower? Uh-oh. Uh-oh, detailed You're question. getting deep. <laughs> but they had four Prattney uh, engines on mm -hmm. there, which were the best engines in the w world, um, maybe except that uh, English Spitfire, mm -hmm. the engine they had. It, and it, it, that was a good engine. Mm -hmm. But anyway, I said... Uh, <laughs> Let me back up a, a, because I did make one error. It, instead of 32,000, we were flying at 28,000. B-17s were at 32,000. Mm -hmm. And we could get over the target areas faster. We felt like that was an advantage. Mm -hmm. When you'd get on the IP, which meant you on, then you were on the bomb run. And uh, me in the ball turret, and all ball, ball turrets, you, you can look at all of the planes in the sky around you. We put our guns straight down because the fighters didn't come in because they were really giving us anti-aircraft fire left and right. And those German uh, 88, the most efficient weapon in the world as far as, uh, and I'm talking about tank warfare or shooting down planes. They had a battery of four and you know a lot of these were probably operated by civilians on the ground and they would always tell us in briefings when we'd go to briefing and find out where the mission was going to be that you know they they would kid us a little bit they said well you, you know you're going to vienna today and vienna's got more anti-aircraft guns than any target you're going to face I said, well, that doesn't sound good. And they said, well, if you do get shot down, there's a streetcar you can catch. <laughs> and, you know, that, that kind of kid. Well, let me, let me just ask straight to the, some of the questions because uh, uh, you were a gunner. I was a ball turret gunner. So uh, it was a cramped space. Yeah. Very cramped. Uh, I'm assuming, I mean, your, your job was to protect the plane when there were enemy aircraft yeah. coming towards you. Yeah. Yeah, and did you have to use your gun? Never, never used it. But I tell you, there was a lot of times when they would call out mm -hmm. that you know a fighter in the area, and you know way off, you you really couldn't tell, and, and you'd sit there and pray that it's going to be you know a P fifty one Mustang. Mm -hmm. And, and and that's the way it was. I mean, the German Air Force, I'll just say this right up front, 
which had been, a, you know, a really a top-notch Air Force because be, before my brother and I got overseas, these, uh, I, I remember one particular mission I read about, knew about, 64 bombers were shot down by the German fighters. Now, a lot of fighters were shot down because in that ball turret, I, I had a Sperry, the, the ball turret itself was made by Sperry, and I had a, a gun sight that was out, out of this world. I, I had to know the wingspan like of a ME-109, and as soon as I would put that in the instrument, this was right here, uh, then I operated with my right foot, and any time I got a fighter, and of course this didn't apply because I was lucky, but I just kept, you know, the wingspan in this, and when it got to a certain place, I'd fire two fifties, and I guarantee you, it's it coming was, down. Yeah, yeah, that's right. Now, it was Worth in that same plane with you? Or was, no, he was in another plane. He was in another another plane and another squadron, but we were only about about a mile apart. Mm -hmm. And uh, but anyhow, Worth was uh, in a uh, the nose turret, mm -hmm. and so he could watch my plane carefully. And, and of course, he had said he pushed up because we were wearing helmets mm -hmm. and all. Push his helmet up, see if my plane was still there, and pull it back down. Mm -hmm. Let's pause for one second. Uh, we're continuing with John Barber. And uh, John, you were getting ready to tell us you were going to share with us some, uh, maybe some terrifying moments. Right. Let's hear about that. Okay. The first mission that we went on happened to be the worst mission that I ever flew. Mm -hmm. We've heard that twice today. Have you? Mm -hmm. Uh, and the reason it was the target was Vienna, and uh, we had a, a German shell now from one of these eighty-eight artillery. <coughs> that shell passed through the part of our tail section without exploding. I mean, it, you're talking about the good Lord looking at you. Mm. I mean, he looked at it. it. didn't, you know, break any of the the wiring uh, or the cables. Cables are so important, you know. Mm -hmm. But the, in, in, in that first mission I went on, I, and I did have my feet in the ball turret, and I was sitting there with a black suit on and a helmet on. The first, you know, flight that I had heard, and boy, it's awful. If you think you don't hear it up, up you know, at 28,000 feet, you hear it loud mm -hmm. and clear. And, uh, but anyhow, a piece of shrapnel came in through the right side and went out through the left side. Didn't hit me, thank goodness. Mm -hmm. But uh, it got my attention. And we threw tinsel out to, you know, to disrupt the radar. That's exactly right. Mm -hmm. And, uh, one of my crew members, or one that I think a whole lot of, and he's still with us, uh, a boy from uh, Pennsylvania, he he would never look out. He just threw tinsels out, but he would never look out a waste wonder to see what about the flak or if there were any German fighters or, around. Because, well, he just said he couldn't do it. But he, he was good about putting the, the tinsel mm -hmm. in that. Throwing it out. John, would you say you were scared to death? Well, it, it was a frightening thing. Mm -hmm. And uh, and my brother agreed with me, too. I mean, you know, what was happening to his squadron. Mm -hmm. Now, the squadron I was in, we were at headquarters company there in Italy. And uh, Huxemeyer, after we had just been in, at this base in Italy a short time, was made a lead pilot which really put us in a good position because we were the one at the highest level of these other squadrons below us. Plus the fact the German, if, if you do have a fighter coming into the picture, they pick off the ones down there at the lower end, mm -hmm. the, the stragglers, so to speak. Mm -hmm. And, uh, but again, I'm not, saying a whole lot about fighters because flak 
I mean, you can't imagine what it does to you when it's just so much going on right around you. When they say flack, it's, it's basically just kind of... Uh, that uh, are being, could be fired. I know these are folk on flack this right now. But I think it's so important that, uh, that all of our citizens, uh, and especially our students that are in school, learn as much as they can about what uh, happened between 1941 and 1945. Uh, that was the, the thousands and thousands and thousands of lives that were lost uh, in defending our country. And, uh, and that, uh, I'll say this, that and I, I know I'm, we're talking about World War II now, but my brother did give his life in, a, in a, another war that I'm not going to discuss at this time. Maybe I'm still around when they start discussing the Korean War. I feel that you, it, it's obvious that you carry your brother with you every day of your life. Every day. And, and I can tell, uh, Don, would you not agree with me? Yeah that uh, the, the tribute that you're making right now about your experience in World War II is, is not about John, it's about John and Worth. Yeah. And I value that, and I think the people that are listening uh, through this videotape can value that. I what, appreciate you saying that. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Well, John, we have uh, uh, run out of our scheduled time. Uh, is there any final comment you'd like to say before I wrap up? Yeah, my wife's going to say that, John, you were moving your hands around a lot. Well, George Bush uh, George Bush did that. I know he, he, he moved his hands around a lot. So yeah. Maybe that's where I picked it up. Can't be all that bad. <laughs> that's right. Okay, well, John, on behalf of the Rotary Club of Moxville, and on behalf of uh, Don and myself, I want to thank you for coming out and sharing part of your story about World War II. And as a, uh, as a fellow that was born in 1967, uh, way after uh, the uh, end of the war happened, uh, I appreciate uh, folks like you and Frank who were willing to uh, potentially sacrifice your life, but certainly give your life and service to our country during that time. So that will end our uh, interview on uh, October the 1st, 2009, of uh, some of our Davie County veterans. And on behalf of the Rotary Club of Moxville, thank you for listening. And as we've ended every video, I'll end it again. Be proud to be an American. <laughs>